wherever you're watching around Australia on Seven Sport, around the world or around the country here in the USA on Speed. Welcome back to Circuit of the Americas, Austin, Texas. I'm Matt White alongside Neil Crompton and Mark Scaife as we get ready for race two today, which will be race 14 of the championship. Remember, they have already done the qualifier for this one. Wind Cup will start on pole. This is our location, the fifth event of 2013. And speaking metrically, 3.68 kilometres or Imperial 2.28 miles, 20 turns. In fact, it's turned out the case that there are more passing opportunities than we thought when we looked at this on paper. We saw a great race, number 13. It's got an average speed, this racetrack, of about uh, 140 kilometres an hour. Top speed of 240 kilometres an hour. And so far, so good for Circuit of the Americas and V8 supercars. And Neil, we've been talking a lot this weekend about tyre management. And uh, tyre management. Sorry. Let me tell you why we babble on about that because it is such a critical part of the weekend. Let's have a look. If you look at the layout of the total weekend from the moment we arrive here, we've got practice one, two, three, and four. We've got qualifying one and two, three, and four. We've got race one, two, three, and four. Now, typically, when you arrive at a circuit, you'll use old tyres to get around, have a bit of a look around. Well, I can tell you, it's not efficient to freight, or nor are you allowed to freight used tyres to the other side of the world. You just wouldn't do that. So you've got to use your allocation from seven sets of tyres. Now, you've only got to work out 12 sessions there is there. Seven sets of tyres just doesn't cut it. So that's why you're seeing all this quirky tyre management going on. Now, the race is pretty simple. They're 27 laps, 100 k's, and you must pit. You must put on a minimum of two tyres. You can put four if you like. The reason we're seeing people only put two on is because of all of this. Now, you have to pit post lap 10 and that's to save the kerfuffle everyone will dive in earlier if they can and what you saw typically is everyone dived in just in around here and they do that so they can't get undercut they get in they get their new tires on they get out and cut out some fast laps get ahead of their competitors now there's one other little thing i just want to rub out here and show you when you look at the circuit if i can just quickly draw a piece of circuit and if we call this the corner a couple of corners coming onto the straight there's our main straight there the entry to the pit lanes in here goes like this there's our pits there we go so cars this is our pit in here our cars blaze around here and onto the main straight you wonder why a team when we come to a pit we know we've got to hit the speed limiter the 40k sign is actually right up there not around here somewhere so this tiny little bit when you peel off here, this tiny little bit of roadway here you could possibly pick up two, three or four tenths if you get that right. I was watching the Team Red Bull guys. Let me tell you, they got that right. And the other one to watch, they've obviously thought about this whole, we're going to put two tyres on. Have a look in this next race compared to the other teams in pit lane, how their pit men work just doing the two tyres. And two or three tenths here, two or three tenths there, doesn't sound like much. Neil just told you, 240 kilometres an hour down the straight. Two, three, four, five, six tenths, work out the distance. Guys, the atmosphere here on the grid is it's just fantastic. An incredible crowd down here just soaking all in and enjoying the atmosphere. It was a tough first race here at Austin for Shane Van Gisbergen. They checked the tyres while the cars were under park Fermat and that put him down the rear of the grid. But now he's on the second row for this race. Shane, uh, tough in the first race, but this is a lot better spot to be starting from. <laughs> I can see the lights from this one. Yeah, that was uh, race 13 it was then, so it's quite an unlucky one for us. But the uh, car was fast. I think we set one of the fastest laps. And... Uh, yeah, now we're up the front. Hopefully we can run with the front, guys. I'll be stoked. Yeah, you got those two quick Red Bulls ahead of you, Shane. All the very best. Enjoy it. Yeah, cheers, man. So Shane Van Gisbergen there, second row of the grid. And uh, I'll just bring you back for a bit of a wander down the grid. Just on the back of the car here, the Tour de Cure logo. You remember I was missing in Perth, riding that across Australia. We raised about $2.5 million for cancer research. John o. Webb came on the ride for a few days, and they're great supporters of Tour de Cure. So it's great to see the logo up on the car and being carried here to the United States. Uh, out on the grid, well, it is just chock-a-block, shoulder to shoulder at the moment, and rightly so. A great chance to get in here, to feel the atmosphere, to enjoy it with people, to get close to the cars and the drives it's something very unique about this sport the access to drivers and cars and everyone down here enjoying it and having a pretty good day including Gary Rogers g'day Gary but we want to get down and uh, have a chat to his man young Scotty McLaughlin who has done a, an awesome job so far this year and Scotty's just belted in ready to go we might just see him pinch a, a quick word with Scotty Scotty uh, been a busy year for you it's been a bit of an up and down weekend so far looking for some better fortune in race 14 yeah, I don't know what happened there. I don't even know who hit me, but uh, yeah, a bit unfortunate, but that's racing. 
Got on with it, had a bit of fun. I'm loving the Circuit of the Americas and uh, loving being over America for the first time. So you use one word there that I think underlines your year, fun. Uh, all the way through this, this incredible season, you've just had a big smile on your face and you're having a great time. Well, there's, uh, there's 28 seats here and I'm, I've got one of them. And, you know, there's like heaps of people in Australia who want this seat and uh, I'm just so glad to be here and living the dream. I'm having so much fun. Well, you've really made the most of it and you've overachieved. Well done, Scott. Keep it rolling today, mate. All the best. Yes, thank you. Not only has he got a seat, he's also got a place in the V8 Supercar record books as the youngest ever race winner in our category. So we're gearing up now for the final race of day one of the Austin 400. One of the standout features of this circuit, that's the observation tower, 77 metres or 251 feet, rises above the air. 419 stairs will take you there if the lift is not working. 419. I only know because somebody told me. I didn't go and count them. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Beretta was up there earlier and uh, just said it was a simply amazing view. You can see the city limits, if you like, Austin city limits. There you go. And look down right around the circuit, a glass um, bottom as well, so you can see right underneath you. Russell Ingle. Known in our parts as the enforcer. He's been around a hell of a long time. He's now 49 years of age, and this will be his 519th race. And on the flip side to that, you're looking at the youngest guy one in the field, people, Chaz Mostert. Not the youngest, but one of the youngest, 21 years of age, about to have his fifth race. In the case of Russell, he's got some damage at the back of that car. The, the boot lid on the car has been damaged, which in turn has changed the rear wing angle. And they think they've also got a shock absorber problem with the back of that car after some of the contact in the early laps of race 13. As David, David Reynolds, Reynolds, we saw the, the red face. I mean, I, as Matt said before, I don't think I've seen the guys in such poor physical condition going into a race like this. It's, it's been very hard to recover. And you don't mean that they're unfit, you just mean that they've been smashed about. I mean, they are used to heat. I mean, we get some pretty heavy heat, especially to start the season at the Clipsal 500. They've raced in Bahrain, they've raced in Abu Dhabi as well. And um, they're used to that kind of stuff. They are used to cool suits failing on them, but there's just something different about this one. It's really knocked the guys around. Feet flag, formation left, feet flag. Check out the view. So starting grid for a look at race number 14 of our championship and a great pole position. Jamie Whitcup, the fastest lap of the weekend to achieve that. He's 0.25 quicker than his teammate, Craig Lowndes. Fabian Coulthard went quicker than the pole time he set for the previous race, but it wasn't quite enough. He'll be alongside Van Gisberg. And then it's Jonathan Webb and Rick Kelly, outstanding performance in the Nissan Altima. Then Will Davison, the first of the forwards, position seven from the fast Frenchman, Alex Bremer from eight. And then Scott McLaughlin, the 19-year-old Kiwi from position number nine. And James Moffat, we just heard from him on the grid again doing another great job inside that top 10. David Wall in 11th after finishing top 10 in the previous race. Tony D'Alberto and Michael Caruso side by side. David Reynolds as we mentioned he's really feeling the effects of this heat and hard work. 100 k's around here might go quickly but it's certainly tough on the drivers. Chas Mostert has Jason Bright who made a mistake in that qualifying session for this race on his flying lap hence the reason why he has qualified so far back. Two tireless campaigners Garth Tander and Russell Ingle, both former V8 supercar champions. Alex Davison with Lee Holdsworth from Irwin Racing and the Mercedes-Benz AMG E63. So our category this year is made up of four manufacturers. On the grid, we've got 15 Holden Commodores, six Ford Falcons, four Nissan Altimers and three Mercs. So a number of people trying to also make not only the normal uh, service changes to their car between the races, but a lot of little go-fast changes as well. Now, look at the back of Todd Kelly's car. I went into that garage, and he said to me, Neil, I don't think we're going to get this car out in time because the whole rear bumper assembly and the whole under tray of the car is missing. And the first thing he said to me was, who, who did it? <laughs> he wanted to have a full post-mortem. I said, oh, at the first lap of the race, Todd, there were about 10 uh, guys out there swinging punches and lots of victims, but a lot of damage on the back. They clearly did get that car out, but it'll be semi-undressed now for this race.
Guys, just down on pit wall with a man who uh, knows these conditions and how to prepare the drivers for them, uh, Glenn Lindsay, who is the uh, high performance manager for Ford Performance Racing, of course, background in Formula One. Glenn, just tell us how much race one here today took out of these guys and how do you get them ready to go again? Uh, massive amount for, for uh, two of our drivers, two of which the cool suit failed, one of which the drink bottle also failed. So, uh, you know, desperate for fluid intake and body temp went through the roof. Uh, we had a couple of drivers just about collapsing. Uh, yeah, it was uh, pretty, a bit, bit nightmarish at the time, to be honest. But uh, no, all good now. We've got their vol fluid volumes back up. We've got their body temps down. So I've got my fingers crossed. Two, all right, so we, mate. Thank you. There'll be one grid box Perfect. empty because David Wall has entered pit lane. I'm not sure if he's gone straight to his garage, but he appeared quickly under our commentary position. And uh, here he is, top right of screen. You can see the green number 21 car. Yeah, it hasn't even made it back to the pit box. So the winner of the first race was Jamie Winkup. He will start from pole position alongside his teammate, Clark Lance. Cars are grinning up. So they will start how they finished now. the previous race, even though they've already qualified for this one earlier in the day. Heavy haulage Australian Mercedes Benz of Tim Slade. Got a Stars and Stripes effect. There's green Damian flag, White green in charge. Who will get the jump from the teammates? Well, it's pretty even, but Shane Van Gisbergen missed it. And these, about the third row, they're going to be three or four wide heading up here to turn one. Wing Cup holds his ground on the inside. Jonathan Webb sneaks up into third position. And now Craig Lowndes is going to duel with his teammate, one of the fastest parts of the circuit. Wasn't that wild. Nice job, Jamie Wincup, to stay there on the outside and actually get that done. Jonathan Webb jumped up the third. That was opportunistic at turn one. Rick Kelly's gone to fourth. Shane Van Gisbergen dropped back as a result of that tardy start. Fabian Coulthard really suffered there from grid spot three. And has a dive down the inside of Van Gisbergen in the Lockwood entry and done. He's well, grabbed Rick Kelly as well. Rick ran wide, understeered. Couldn't actually get it done. He might have got some help along the way. I think he got a little bump there from Coulthard as he did it. He couldn't pull up, so Coulthard dived down the inside of Van Gisbergen. But when he got there, there was a, a, a Nissan parked. So he, he gave him a little rub. So this is pretty wild in the middle of the field. Dalberto around the outside of Caruso and Kramer. Around the outside also was Mark Winterbottom with Van Gisberg. And look at this. This is fast. Turn 17, 18. They get it done. They got round there very nicely. Very deep breaking from Van Gisberg. And he'll be battling to stay on the road. They get back to 205 k's on the run into there now. Davison down the inside. He's got a little bit of damage on the right rear of that car. As well, so we'll recheck the order. It's Win Cup, he's got 0.3 of a second from Lowndes, then Webb, then Coulthard, Rick Kelly, Will Davison. There's Shane Van Gisbergen on screen in the VIP Pet Foods entry. Winterbottom, where Riding Wiz is eighth, then Moffat and McLaughlin tenth, and a big lock up for McLaughlin on the run into one. It's Tander and Todd, Todd Kelly having a bit of a battle there. Todd moves it out on Courtney. Look at this Tander and Courtney alongside each other in the same way as the Red Bull Holdens a couple of laps ago. Todd didn't realise that James was out there. No. He thought he was racing with Garth Tander. It turns out there was another car painted identically, uh, also side by side. So that was close. I held my breath on that one. There's been some really high quality stuff in those opening couple of laps. These two guys turned it on at turn two. That was unbelievably close and a great job by Winkup to get around the outside of Lounge. He wouldn't have done it with anybody else but his teammate in that circumstance. So we're very good up into third. Rick Kelly still in fifth as a consequence of that little bumping duel. And it's really wild in the middle section there. You can see Russell Engel with Dave Reynolds. The rehearsals helped because compared to the first lap of race 13, things are a little calmer. Here's the replay of the start. This is close. He's been run over towards the fence. He got away with that. Oh, so that's Winterbottom. Down the inside. He almost got his teammate. And have a look just up in front there. There's plenty of cars. Again, teammates alongside each other in that area. 
So the Wilson Security Racing car, as I mentioned, went into pit lane at the start. So they've had some issue there. They've got it out, but it hasn't gone very far. David Wall's day has come to an early end. As these two FPR Fords get side by side up over the rise, they're trying to hunt down the VIP Pet Foods Commodore of Shane Van Gisbergen, but in doing so, they may well take each other out. Well, that, the way that unfolded then, Mark Winterbottom on the racetrack ended up with Will Davison right out wide on the Astro turf, so that would have been very close. James Moffat's in here as well. These guys are battling for seventh, eighth, ninth. Fastest lap of the race, Jamie Wincup. He's got a half a second margin over his teammate. some pressure on the Norton Nissan of James Moffat. This is one of the good design features of this track because if you get down the inside, you then got to battle for the next little section. So the turn that goes left, you can have a dive there, but you haven't got the job done unless you can get back in front before the next right-hander. So those design features have actually been built into this in terms of raceability, very, very good. So we've seen the two Red Bull cars side by side at turn one. We've seen the two HRT cars side by side. We've seen the two FPR cars side by side. And now the Fujitsu cars are ganging up. And mate, just, sorry, mate, just to put a full stop on the David Wall car stopped on the side of the circuit. It's an oil pressure problem. That's why they stopped him in the pit lane. They had none. Thought it might be a sensor. The pressure come back up, but it's obviously gone again. And they had that very same problem yesterday in practice one, Mark and they had to park the car, and then they had a starter motor fail and couldn't start it. Meanwhile, back at the front of the field, big pressure again between Winkup and Lowndes. Replay of the action up into turn one here, and watch what happens here to the two Pepsi Fords. Winterbottom's on the inside, and it ends up that Will has to open the steering and ease himself to the right on the AstroTurf. Give me a bit of strife, I reckon, again. That's, that's on the verge, especially with your teammate. If you watch the angle of the middle of that corner and the way the car runs, there's just always some controversy about how much room you give the guy on the outside. It's called racing room. There's always conjecture about it. And when the teammates are involved, it becomes a bit more intense. And that gave Shane Van Gisberg in a hurry up, as you just saw on that lap. He posted the fastest lap, 135.0. Burrow Engel, meantime, in one of the Mercedes E63s has come into the pit lane, touring along gently. There he is up on screen at the moment. So uh, he hasn't reached the compulsory pit stop window opening, so clearly he's got a damaged tyre or some other issue that has forced that car into the pit lane. It's got about six inches of towing on the front right hand corner, so that'll do it. What's that? Is that 150 mil? Yeah, yeah, funny, Neil, I was just going to report that in, but I think if you can't see that, you're not looking. Not <laughs> <laughs> as much towing as MS had at the bar last night. <laughs> <laughs> Is that why he didn't pay? 134.9 now for Shane Van Gisbergen. That yellow VIP Pet Foods car number 97 is on the charge, but Jamie Winkup is holding off his teammate. In the early stages here, the second race of the Austin 400 circuit in the Americas. The Aussie V8s are putting on a real brute of a show. Well, the weather's nice and clear here in Austin, but things are starting to brew on the racetrack. Still more than 20 laps to go. They're starting to gang up and it's looking a bit ugly. And normally when this happens, there is contact like that on Todd Kelly. You got a clip in the rear of the Nissan Altima, which is already looking decidedly secondhand by Jason Bright. And this is being replayed across various little battle groups. Jamie Winkup leads by the way and Bright locks it up, smacks into the front of Kelly who now tries to get down towards turn two without rustling the Jill Wen Falcon of Alex Davison. So that would put a flat spot on Jason Bright's tyre. Todd Kelly getting battered from pillar to post today and he's still in the wars with Tony Delberto here. The whole back of the car's damaged on the Nissan. Now you can also see that the door seal around the passenger's front door on Todd's car is flapping in the breeze there as well. So he's caught that whack from Jason Bright time that margins continue to tighten, Lowndes and Wincup are at it. He's been trying to apply pressure Craig Lowndes, but he hasn't got it done yet. This is Lee Holdsworth. There's an amazing battle going on back here. Believe it or not, this is for 22nd, 23rd and beyond. And Pi 
and Holdsworth only a couple of minutes ago were in an absolute arm wrestle to the death. Well, Mario Ingle, it's cooler here in the garage, but I know you want to be out on the track. What happened? Yeah, you're right. Um, look, I went down the inside of uh, Dino, Dino Fiori, and um, yeah, he just turned in and, and didn't leave any room, and uh, just snapped the front uh, front steering. Hey, look, it's been a tough introduction to V8 supercars for you. you. You keep chipping away, you will get there. You are due for some good luck pretty soon. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, qualifying in Perth was obviously quite good. Unfortunately, we've taken a bit of a step backward here, but uh, not a great day in terms of racing. Pretty unlucky. Yeah, we know you'll be back up there soon. Great to have you in the championship, Mara. Yeah, cheers. It's on out here on the track where it's... Lee Holdsworth ducks across to the left-hand side of the circuit. He's got his Erebus Motorsport teammate next to him. Jason Bright has been a bit of a battering ram over the last lap or so. Remember that Bright will be carrying some damage on that front left tyre. We saw a shot of him a moment ago touring the paddock well wide of the race line. Don't forget they've got a compulsory pit stop to serve here as well and that window opens lap 10 and beyond. We'll see what strategy games are played. Bright got as far as 12 in the last race, unhappy with the behaviour of the car. But as the race progressed, he reported that it actually got stronger as the run went on, but early on he had a lot of understeer and was quite frustrated with the lack of early pace. Meantime, Lowndes has done the fastest split of the first sector. Tim Slade and Tim Blanchard also at it there. You can see that Slade was moving right across the road. Lowndes did do the quickest time to the first sector. His teammate Winkup did the quickest time to the second sector. Anything you can do, I can do faster, he says, as he goes in search of a clean sweep on day one of the Austin 400. This circuit designed by Herman Tilke, who also did the tracks at Yas Marina, Bahrain and Shanghai. So Australian V8 supercars have raced at all of those. By far, this is their most popular. After just a few laps, Todd Kelly, former Bathurst champion, been around a long time, stepped out and said, this is one of the most awesome circuits we've got. This is an interesting battle, boys. Believe it or not, they're battling for last. Not that that's the intention, but... Uh... Only half a lap ago, we had two of these three cars off the road. Tim Blanchard's in 17. There he is down the inside now of Dean Fiore, recovering. And Tim Slade's been in this battle as well in car number 47. Meantime, Jamie Wincup's done the fastest lap of the race at 1 minute 34.3. That's nearly as quick as the time that Jason Bright did on those fresh tyres at the end of race number 13. There he is, two second margin now over Lowndes. So this is what we saw earlier in the day as well. This kind of elastic band seesaw going on between them. And now the pit window's open and responding immediately, Coulthard. Because some of what's going on out here also is very dependent on tyre management, who started on what and what age their tyres are. Some people will preserve, depending on where they are, to have some better tyres for tomorrow. And look, there's a million permutations. That entry was what Mark Mark was talking about before, about how wild it can be through there and how much you can gain if you're willing to push it right up to the speed limit line. That was quick. Man, that was, that was really quick. So Tim Slade's reporting that he's also got power steer issues. So I think they're going to put that car straight in the pit. And what that will be is the entire steering system taking so much shock and load from this enormous whack that it takes on multiple occasions around here on the curbs. And the cars are fundamentally pretty strong, but they're not designed to fly and crunch that hard. Look at this. Oh, as if the back of that car needed more. Who was that masked man? Was that car 17? No, uh, who was it that actually got Todd then? I think the, the easiest way is to go down and see who's got Mostert. that damage on the front. <laughs> Chaz Mostert. Chaz Mostert, yeah. It's a wicked approach. There's a Tech Pro barrier around the, the uh, Armco guardrail on approach to uh, to that pit lane. And I'm really surprised that somebody hasn't hit it. There it is right there, the grey on the left-hand side. But it's so narrow and it's so quick and it's a, still you're still climbing to get back up into pit lane and they'll use everything they can, every inch of that track that still exists there, even though they're coming into pit lane, to get the advantage. Will Davison's just come in from position seven. I'm surprised it's... Oh, Garth Tander, sorry, you couldn't see, but Garth Tander has just missed the game by nothing. That was so close coming into the pit. But the interesting part is they're still going so fast. There's Garth Tander there. But what, what we just saw, our commentary position is overlooking this pit entry. And he was right out sideways. He's so close to hitting the fence. But it, it interests me, Neil, that Wink Cup and Lounge can stay like this. Their tyre 
usage, their deterioration is very, very good. It's the best in the, in the industry at the moment. And it's been the benchmark for several years. Uh, often, it's delivered race outcomes to them. Their consistency's been extraordinary. And it's not very often that you continue to see quick laps being peeled off at this phase of the race. Normally, the degradation of the tyre well and truly uh, overrides any reduction of fuel weight in the car. So they're continuing to be quick at the moment. So wind cup lounge separated by 3.3 seconds. That gap's opening. Here's Russell Ingle, who's uh, anything but happy with the back end of that car at the moment. And he's in a huge battle with his friend, James Courtney. Their respective families are disappearing to Florida after this event to go and attack Disney World. In the case of James Courtney, Karis and the kids, Cadell and Zara, they're going there for eight days. So James is doing the right thing. He's bolting to Indy for the 500 to hang out with his friend Dario Franchitti, who's the defending champion and a three-time winner of the Indy 500. So he's going to hang there and then go to Detroit for the Indy car race at Belle Isle. I was talking to, look at that, that was the image of Tanda. I haven't seen a car get that close to the Armco there yet, so that was a big moment for Garth Tanda on pit entry. I reckon the go for James Courtney is to get the ANZ Falcon and swoop in on the credit card, <laughs> report it stolen, because <laughs> for eight days, he's gone skin. I actually asked him, I said, did you say eight? <laughs> <laughs> and so, therefore, he's going to a car race. There's only so much of that you can take. <laughs> So uh, there he is, car number 22, James Courtney. He's been here a couple of times, once in karting, and then he also came here when he was driving in the Japanese GT Championship at the California Speedway in Fontana. That was back in the early to mid-2000s before he became a regular face in the V8 Supercar Championship. He's one of uh, four drivers who's had some US experience prior to coming here. We spoke to Jason Bright a little bit earlier on that topic. Alex Davison won here in Carrera Cup in 2002 at Indianapolis. Great performance. He's had plenty of international experience. And Alex Kremer also drove in the ALMS at Laguna Seca a few years ago. So a few of the boys have had some exposure. There's an extraordinary number of the younger guys who've never been to the States full stop. So their eyes are wide open here about the passion for motorsports, about this facility. Uh, it's a great playground for those that have got a love for motorsport. About this city. About this city. So that's the look into the, the final goal, uh, corner. And here comes Lowndes. People that have pitted already from position two and it's the reverse it was a 3.7 second lead by the time that Lowndes was called into pit lane Break Jamie Winkup speed. was starting Break to drop him a bit spinning of the rear wheel please get you to hang out there for a little bit longer before I get you across please this is Alex Bremer second year in the championship doing a much better job this year. And this man in WI with our last event. Well, good. See, ya. <laughs> see you later. Won his 91st time. race win. And, and he's now the all-time leader, eclipsing our Mark Scape, so he's top of the list. And now he goes to the top of the hill, Phil Hill. 1961. Formula One world champion, but they filled it in, so it's got a dual purpose, that nickname. <laughs> Only American born driver to win the championship. Mario Andretti did it in uh, 78, but he wasn't born here. And in fact, Mario Andretti cut the first laps at this circuit, the official opening of October 21, 2012. Fabian Coulthard's just done the fastest lap of the race. New record of 1 minute 34.1. There's a little bit more cloud cover out there now than there was in race 13. That might be helping, possibly rubbering up a little bit as well. And it goes back a bit to that tyre story that we're talking about. In, in the analysis of the battle between Lowndes and Wind Cup, an interesting thing that Aaron Noonan unfolded earlier in the week, just looking at the stats in the early part of the, the year, that um, since Sandown 2012, Craig's only started on the front row twice, whereas Jamie Wincup's been up there 14 times. So they race well. Look at this, Fabian's having a big go here with Lance. He might grab him. They race brilliantly with that Triple Eight car of Craig Lowndes, and he's been getting some results. But when you give your teammate that kind of head start in qualifying, and that level of inconsistency really bites, and that's what's really been hurting Craig Lowndes. So if you can tidy up the whole qualifying argument, that will certainly help Craig Lowndes as he tries to grab another championship. Most of the guys are coming out of pretty cool autumn conditions at home into a, a scorching spring here in Austin. Uh, Tim Edwards, just wanted to get a feel for your 
guys. I know they were hurting a little bit after our earlier race. Fatigue, is it an issue for your drivers? Oh, for sure. I mean, definitely in the first race they struggled a bit. We made some improvements to the cool suit, a bit more ventilation into the car, ice in their drink bottle, all that sort of stuff, just to try and help them out in this race. But, yeah, she's pretty warm out there. She's got a 60-degree cabin temperature. Thanks, Mark. And Barrett's Shane Van Gisbergen has just posted the fastest time, a lap record, 133.59. So the first seven drivers in the field yet to stop. And they include Jamie Wincup, Jonathan Webb, James Moffat, Michael Caruso, Alex Davis and Scott Pye and Jason Bright, who's carrying, I think, a little bit of tyre damage on that front tyre at the moment. Yeah, I'm quite fascinated by this Red Bull strategy, Neil, um, just watching Wink Up still out there because we often talk about the undercut. You need to get in, get out on your new tyres. But with guys all putting two tyres on, you're only seeing half the benefit or maybe a little bit more. Which round here, you're talking 1.82 seconds for a new set of tyres. So if everyone's putting on two, they're not going to bounce ahead so they can afford to stay out there. Now, I'm just wondering, well, here we are, Jamie Wink Up's tyres out now. So you can expect to see him pit fairly soon. That leaves him a set of rubber. He's only going to have to do sort of what? Seven or eight, nine laps. Good call. Nice stop there for the Techno Auto Sports Group. Now goes Jonathan Webb quickly. We just saw the track temperature 46 degrees Celsius. That is, Matthew. 15. Gisbergen really making ground on the leaders. He's made a lot of ground on Coulthard. It's Jeff Slater in the background speaking to Jonathan Webb after that pit stop. And some real urgency about that one too. There's a lot of calming effect going on between engineers and drivers, but that one was let's press on here. This is the moment where we've got to land a blow. So John O. Webb has been given a real burst of encouragement verbally from his team. Because, Let's see how he responds. It's because those last couple of race meetings for him have been a little bit lacklustre by their own standards. So New Zealand and Western Australia didn't really deliver for them. A reasonably strong run, in fact, a very strong run in Adelaide. As now the leader of the race comes in, Jamie Wincup. 12 and a half second lead from James only. Moffat. Rears only, so I need your foot on the uh, two feet. One on the brake, one on the clutch. No spinning of the wheels for me, please. So you to hang out there for a little bit longer before I get you across, please, mate. Red Bull Racing Australia making absolutely sure that they manage this wheel spin issue. Good policy. Now, I don't know if you saw Lowndes a stop a minute ago. If you didn't watch this one carefully, we talked about the efficiency. I've watched guys down there still using two men to do the stop. Now, watch this. Whack. Done. Off. This guy gets it out of the road. This guy on. Bang. Done. Gone. See you later. Fantastic. Well done, Marco. That's a that is a great demonstration of teamwork and the way that they have... Use the method and the system to do that. No fuss is the benchmark at the moment. You don't win races just by being fast on the track. There's all the other complexity attached to this sport, and that's one of them. Interesting that Mark Dutton fully enunciated the track position there for Jamie Wincup. The reason is you're so far to the left of the road, your mirrors in the periphery will not see the cars coming up the hill. So he gave him a full-blown commentary all the way to the braking area and the turning point at turn one. You, you're in front, you're in the lead. He gave him a full picture. That was a very important strategic message for Jamie Wincup in managing this race. We'll be back with more from Austin in just a moment. Now on lap 20 out of 27 for the last race of the day here at the Austin 400. They're pretty cool, calm and collected at Red Bull Racing Australia. And why wouldn't you be? Because they're heading towards another 1-2. They've got this remarkable knack of going to new circuits and just making it work for them. In particular, Jamie Winkup. He could win two out of two here, but he's not done with yet. Craig Lowndes is behind him, Fabian Coulthard. So those three guys were on the podium in our first race of the day. But Shane Van Gisbergen is still showing some good back-end pace. You're riding now with Wing Cup. The field is yet to be cleansed, by the way. Michael Caruso, Scott Pye and Jason Bright yet to take their compulsory pit stop. really gives us a great understanding of just how busy the boys are around here. So much going on in the cockpit of the cars. And remember that this sport is as much about feet and the 
control of the motor car with the driver's feet as it is the hands. So they're very busy in there at the moment, all of them. This is turn 17 and 18, the fast right-hander. Slowest point in the middle of the corner is 150 kilometres an hour, but they exit the corner at 190 kilometres an hour and get back to just over a little above 205 clicks. And here we are into the last couple of corners. What we'll do now is have a little look at the margin here and just go, check and take a breath. Craig, keep pushing very hard in turn two. Keep doing what you're doing, mate. So even though these guys are fifth and, uh, fourth and fifth on the timing at the moment, remember there are three drivers to stop. So that's the margin first to second. There's Coulthard effectively in third, followed by Van Gisbergen. Next is Jonathan Webb in the Darrell Lee entry, followed by Rick Kelly in the Nissan. Mark Winterbottom in the Ford Falcon, Scott McLaughlin here, Holden Commodore, Will Davis and Ford, teammate David Reynolds, Ford. Then it is James Moffat, Alex Bremer, Garth Tander here in the Holden Racing Team entry. His teammate James Courtney next, followed by Russell Ingalls. So all three cars are from that stable, pretty much line astern. So who's got what left in terms of tyre wear? This is Mark Winterbottom, so he's 10th. That's a net position of 7th. He hasn't won for a year, Frosty. In fact, it will be a year to the day tomorrow. And his last win at Phillip Island on May 19. It's his birthday on Monday, turn 32. He had a couple of near misses earlier in the year as well where he thought we, he was going to win a race, particularly down in Tasmania for Mark Winterbottom, so frustrating for him. But it's been an incredibly intense season, certainly in the first part, in trying to get a result. The difference between Hero and Zero at the moment in the field is so finite, such a tiny margin. Let's stay with this. We'll watch Mark Winterbottom on the run up to turn one. We'll stick with it for the entire lap. So sit back, crank up the audio and watch the 3.68 kilometres of the Circuit of the Americas here in Austin. a lap ago because his speed prior to that was very similar. Scott Pye now comes in and he stops so there's only Michael Caruso who hasn't stopped. And as you said Neil there's a lot of different lines even the way they get into turn two the way they approach this next phase you'll have a look sometimes the cars are crossed over differently for turn three. The next piece is reasonably similar because there's pretty much only one line through this slalom complex there. This next section there's not a lot of difference in but there's a lot of difference in what, it, what is essentially the slower and trickier end and he might be close enough now. Down to turn 12. He's almost got the nose in there. That was as close as it gets without giving it a bump. So this is 12 up to 13. We'll see whether he can do the crisscross. There's normally a spot down into 15 where they break and turn. If he's close enough he'll get down the inside. That's the spot there that caught the just covered very nicely. And Shane changed his line on that lap, and the reason he did it is because he had Jonathan Webb behind. So if he exposed the rear of the car to Jonathan, he would have jammed the number 19 car straight down in there. So five laps to go is the message going out on the radio to this group. And 
Munster. There's two games going on here for Van Gisbergen at the moment. He's got to really look in both directions to cover this one. It's a battle for the Kiwi pride between Fabian Coulthard and Shane Van Gisbergen. So this is for fourth, fifth and sixth. just leave bigger gaps at certain stages and you think that Fabian's got a much better run on him now he takes a look at the uh, left hand side and then all of a sudden it's nose to tail again the watching brief is Jonathan Webb Techno Autosports team boss Jonathan will be heartened by this because uh, he doesn't have as much V8 supercar experience as part of a 97, Shane Van Gisbergen, a bit of Kiwi pride there in the crowd. So, um, so all year he's uh, just been trying to come to terms with the raw speed that Van Gisbergen can display. We know we've seen that over the years and so he'll be pretty happy about the fact that uh, those two are locked in combat. Van Gisbergen almost ran wide at turn 12 and that's allowed Fabian just to stretch that gap just a little bit. You and I went for a long walk and drive around the circle when we first got here. Scaifey, oh, oh, Alex Davison's getting a shove along from Russell Ingle in the Stanley 66 Commodore. Super cheap auto backed. I was trying to think of who this circuit would suit in the fast and flowing parts of the circuit. One of the names that sprung to mind was Shane Van Gisbergen. And that's what we're seeing right now in his battle with Fabian Coulthard. I don't think this one's over, boys. No. It never is when Russell's in it. Oh, look at this. Jonathan's having a crack at his teammate here. That's going to get interesting. And Fabian just locked it up a little at the top, at the rise. So Webb had to lock the brake and turn in deeper there. In, in doing that, he's actually grabbed the curb and flown the car across it. Wouldn't have liked that hit. He's actually lost some ground in the process. 105th V8 supercar start for Jonathan Webb. 177th V8 supercar start for Shane Van Gisbergen. And that little exchange actually let Fabian Coulthard off the hook just in the last couple of corners. And that's what we saw previous race, race 13, when these guys were all battling, Wing Cup was able to sneak away. This is a similar thing. When the guys are battling behind like that, it's taken the heat off Fabian Coulthard. He's got a message from a mate back home saying, eggs, coffee and V8s for breakfast. What a way to start the morning. <laughs> That's uh, Shane Van Gisbergen's dad, Robert. He's enjoying the action from inside the bunker at VIP. Imagine having us for breakfast. <laughs> yeah, there'll be some indigestion for the rest oh. of the day, won't there? Michael Caruso, the race leader, has now pitted, which means that that's everybody ticked off now, and that reveals Jamie Wincup in the corrected lead now. He's got that little margin over his teammate, Craig Lowndes. Here we go, here's Michael. There's a couple of signatures on the right-hand rear of that corner, uh, car, right -hand rear corner of the vehicle. So when Michael went to that team, he took his engineer, Steve Todkill, with him. It was an important thing for him. Great to maintain that relationship that you've got with a successful combination in the engineering part of the business. So he's gone out there with slightly raised tyre pressures, you heard then. And because it's got new tyres on the back of it, they stiffen up the rear anti-roll bar on the car because it's got more grip to accept more load in the rear of the car and uh, make the car uh, behave a little differently. So we're not far from this one being done. And it looks like Wind Cup's going to get the job done once again. How busy is that? When Mark Scaife took us for a run earlier in the week in the road car, the first time through those S's, it was a question of which way does it go? Because it's literally a sea of red, white and blue down there. You get that a bit, don't you? <laughs> which way did it go? <laughs> <laughs> Not only that, but I'll bring it back to my malady for us here. The curbs that have been installed here to keep the V8 supercars on the circuit are red as well, so they're complaining about not being able to see them. The suit here, it's such a hard view from the driver's seat to know where the bitumen ends, where the kerb starts, and then where all that nice stars and stripe colours are uh, painted. Point nine to the allies board. Margin's just tightened up a little bit yes. again between Wink Cup and Lounge, so Craig's not letting him off the hook at the moment. 
So, but it is a, a big margin back to Fabian Coulthard, who's still got his hands full with Van Gisbergen and Webb. This is giving us a really great view. Watch how busy it looks from here. So this is turn two. So if we look out the front of the car, we'll see what it looks like. Look down through here. It's just left and right and left and right and a sea of color. And then a shortcut off the Grand Prix circuit ultimately. This down here. terms with the rhythm of the track and all the nuances of the curbs and here's Van Gisbergen up the inside of Fabian forces the issue gets half the car up there but he's on the wrong side of the car here can he hang on he can't get out too far and wide because Webb will dive in there they're still going on with this good pass oh I thought he was up there enough then that is really good quality racing between those two guys Both won on home soil, and that was a really good exchange. And that's a very complex part of the road, and the duck and the dive and the crisscrossing from Van Gisberg. And this is not done, guys. Got a lap to go, and this will be very interesting to see whether Van Gisberg can get down the inside. It can't happen here. It won't get him into turn one. And look at Winterbottom and Kelly. They're battling in the background between sixth and seventh. to the inside fence there to cover and make sure that he had the inside running to turn one. We know they're not quite as strong in a straight line. They do need a little bit more, but he got away with that. The cover actually helped him. That'll frustrate Winterbottom. There's a couple of good battles here because Wind Cup and Lowndes is tight and it's down to 0.6 of a second. This is the battle going on for third. It's far from result. And the next one in the queue's game on as well. So you've got Kelly and Winterbottom at it. And this could land anywhere. This is the spot. He's come off there well. This is the spot now. Fabian's going to have to block. He's going to have to move it over. He did. He moved it over. That stopped him there. Web up on the outside. That didn't work. He's trying everything known to man to get around. And look in the background. You've still got Kelly and Winterbottom playing a game back there. And a little nudge going on. Van Gisbergen has signaled his intention that he wants to force the issue. He runs right out wide. He loses oh. a spot in that manoeuvre. Ends up on the AstroTurf. He must have lost sight of where Webb was. Well, I don't think he expected Webb to fill the, fill the gap. He dived straight down there, and then he couldn't do the crisscross. So he's lost a spot from what was a very bold manoeuvre. And meanwhile, at the front of the field, this man who loves to travel and loves to win yeah. does it again. Good work. <laughs> right to the end of the line, though. Awesome, we'll push Fabian Coulthard, awesome who holds it, and Mark Winterbottom has got by Rick Kelly, who's coughing and splattering across the line. What a joke! I reckon that's, that has run out of fuel. I reckon that car's run out of fuel. So that means that Kelly finishes eighth. He was on track for sixth. He was in front of Winterbottom. On the last turn, it's all gone away from him. A one-two again for Red Bull Racing Australia. Something weird definitely happened to Rick Kelly because there was actually contact then between Kelly and Winterbottom. And a chequered flag by Cedric Benson. He's at the uh, University of Texas. He was a Longhorn in their football program. I met him the other day. He's a, he's a unit. He's a unit. Yeah. Drafted by the Chicago Bears in the NFL. I think he had the earned. Yeah. 20 odd million last year and the year before. Scafe money. Has he got a stereo on in there, Jamie Winker? He's popping away. <laughs> the man from down under. <laughs> They're playing, playing it down to his headphones. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so there's your one, two, three. Isn't Fabian Coulthard just so impressive? The way he's been holding off the challenges this year, and Jonathan Webb sneaks up into fourth spot. Great effort. Good dice inside the top 10, so we'll get down to uh, Nissan Motorsport and Jack Daniels Racing and find out exactly what happened to Rick Kelly, Todd Kelly there, mid-pack. Tim Blanchard, Dean Fiore in 23rd, and David Wall and both Maro Engel did not make the finish. So that's a new one. 
live music capital of the world. They're pumping in land down under <laughs> to Jamie Winker. It was a nice drive again, and there were several phases of that race where Wincup had to deal with fairly substantial pressure from his teammate Lowndes, who had the eyes on at the beginning. There were sort of three chunks of it, the beginning, the middle, and right at the end. So no relaxing for Wincup. The battle for third was fantastic between Fabian, Jonathan, Shane, that is Coulthard, Webb, and Van Gisbergen. And I'd love to know what happened with Rick Kelly and Mark Winterbottom. Was it just a push and shove at the end, or was there a little technical issue for Rick Kelly? We'll try and get to the bottom of that for you. Standard procedure, check the hot tyre pressures on the car as they come in, and here's the man that's got the job done. Win number five of this championship season takes his career tally on to 69. And this man looking for three title runs on the trot and career title number five. What an achievement that would be. Mark Dunn was there to talk him through it. Craig Lowndes was there to push him on. We got used to these slick professional performances from this team. I said earlier today that when he's leading, he drives like Brock. He's just such a good leader like that. He, he doesn't make mistakes. He drives the car right to the limit of its tyre adhesion. We've said all weekend how hard it is on tyres, but they have just done an extraordinary job. A very, very professional performance by Jamie Winkup today. Jamie Winkup, well done. Two from two here in Austin. What is it about you and travelling around the world that just works so well? <laughs> I'm not sure, but I'll take it, though, without doubt. Um, yeah, obviously... Uh, Cars are very good. Lounsey, uh, Lounsey stepped up again like he did in race two at Perth. So, um, yeah, we had our work cut out there. Crazy hot over here. It looks a bit overcast, but uh, seriously hot inside the car. The, that race one was probably a top five with, with heat inside the cabin for sure. Scafey was just likening your drive to, to Brocky when Brocky was out in front. He says, when you're out in front, you're just so solid, you, you get away with it, no one can catch you. Uh, I don't know about that. I thought Lounsey was going <laughs> to mow me down. But um, the car was good. I just kept the eyes out the front and... Dado, uh, Dado was measuring the gap for me, so uh, very, very happy. And was that just a little bit of men at work down under as you went around that final lap? Yeah, it was, actually. Yeah, we have been planning that for a while. We couldn't come up with the technology. <laughs> so Sounds like you got it. We thought it was a bit appropriate over here. We'd, uh, yeah, a bit of men at work. Great to hear it. Well done, Jamie. Two wins. Well done. Of course, Craig Lowndes, awesome performance once again from Lowndesy. Uh, rock solid, mate. The good news for you is that takes you now to within 14 points of uh, Will Davison in the championship for second spot. Well, that's great. Obviously, uh, look, you know, Barretts, I don't know what Jamie said. It's a bit windier out here. It's, uh, it's been fantastic. Obviously, we, again, we're still learning the track. Our cars have been sensational. I had a good fight with Jamie that time. I had a car to battle with him. So, uh, look, you know, it's credit to the team, to JJ. We didn't quite have it in race one, but we definitely had a lot better car in race two. What is it about your team that just works so well? You continue to produce these incredible results together. Well, I'm not sure. I think that we do work well as a team. And I think that's probably the key point that, uh, you know, after race one, there was a short turnaround. We both had information we shared. We tried to get the cars better than we had in the previous race, and they were. Like, for me, it was such a much more satisfying race to be able to have a good race with Jamie. And it's all a credit to him. He obviously did a fantastic job. He got in and out of the pits. We caught him, but uh, just didn't quite have the pace that we needed. You want to say go to the kids? Yeah, hello, Levi and Chili. Thanks for that. <laughs> Good on you, Lancy. Well done. Enjoy it. Fabian Coulthard, Fabian, well done. Uh, you had to fight to hold on to that podium place, mate. That, that was tough. Yeah, look, uh, I felt like I was battling for the lead there for a second. But, you know, look, all credit to Shane and, you know, to Webby behind me. You know, it was a good, clean, fair race. And, you know, there's not a mark on my car. There's not a mark on his. So, you know, we were playing pretty fair and it's good to get another podium. Two in a day is awesome. They're both of them just quality drivers at the moment too. That was a fantastic duel for us to watch as spectators. Yeah, exactly. You know, they're on, on their form and, you know, you've got to strike while the iron's hot and, you know, they're doing a fantastic job. So we've got a little bit of work to do. You know, we've got to make our car a little bit better. But our overall lap speed's not too bad. We just need to make it, you know, more consistent uh, throughout the run. I don't know how you do it and look so cool and collected, Fabian. Well done. Yeah, I'm pretty hot under the collar. <laughs> don't well, worry about that. Congratulations. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Down here with Jonathan Webb, third pla uh, fourth place, and uh, Shane Van Gisbergen in fifth. Now, I've got to ask you, Pair, that was some great dicing. Cars were both very, very equal. Um, I'm guessing, Shane, you didn't guess that Webby was going to dive in there when he did. Yeah, I thought he would, but uh, we're a long way from home, but uh, we're still here to race cars. We're not here to get it on with spiders. So, oh, it's a good move, but, uh, you know, would have liked fourth. I had a good go at Fabian, but it got hot, so, oh, well. It's uh, pretty happy after the first race. That was terrible. Looks hot, mate. Just look, looking at all the drivers. I mean, you're all very fit. I can see 
you're knackered. It's everyone's saying this is as tough as it gets, yeah? Yeah, you just got no time to rest and my helmet fan fell off so I had none of that, but of course it was working, but um, mine was fine, but yeah, a bit tired when I get out. Webby, it's an interesting dynamic. You know, we watch even, we've seen a bit of it in Formula One lately. We hate team orders. Clearly, there was no team orders going on here. We know that. But sometimes we could see both of you probably had the pace to get past Coulthard. You didn't. I think that's a little bit disappointing. Yeah, I mean, I think that was my first comment to the boys at the radio. I guess we, we stopped later, so I think I had a bit more speed than probably both of them towards the end. But being the good teammate that I am, I sat back a while, thought Shane was having a good crack, and I thought I'll, uh, I'll let him try and get it. But towards the end I thought he's not going he's not going to get this so I got Shane I think one more lap I probably would have got Fab as well but yeah, that's the way it is yeah and I think for us and everyone at home to just watch that happen clearly there is no team oars it actually looks like he was going wide to duck down back under you said here's an opportunity bugger it and went in there and, th and I, in fact I think that's quite refreshing <laughs> yeah exactly as I said I sat back there a little while thought I'd give him a fair run by that stage a last lap it was all uh, all for their own and I wanted uh, that next spot so I took it all right, mate, great to watch and good to see you guys back up and into it. Thank you. So both techno cars inside the top five. Three Kiwis inside the top ten with Fabian Coulthard, Shane Van Gisbergen and Scott McLaughlin. This is the championship picture now after 14 races. So Jamie stretches the lead from Will Davison, but Craig Lowndes closes the gap. He's moving closer and closer up to second in the title race. James Courtney in ninth and John O'Webb moves inside the top ten. The podium, well, it's exactly the same as our first race of the day. Cars 1, 888 and 14. And this is race 14, the 2013 V8 Supercars Austin 400. Would you please welcome our first place driver from Red Bull Racing Australia, Jamie Wincup. Yeah. In second place from Red Bull Racing Australia, Craig Lowndes. And in third place for Lockwood Racing, Fabian Coulthard. Representing our winning team at Red Bull Racing Australia is Adrian Burgess. Making the presentation of the third place trophy is Adam Firth, Director of International Business for V8 Supercars. Presenting to second place is Danielle Eldridge, the Vice President of Corporate Partnerships Circuit of the Americas. Presenting to the winning team is Peter Trimble, acting CEO, V8 Supercars. And making the presentation of the first place trophy is Adam Firth, Director of International Business for V8 Supercars. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2013 V8 Supercars Austin 400 Race 14 winners. So that's now 18 victories away from home for... Jamie Winkup, oh, that's just nasty. And treat the locals like that here. <laughs> but it's a party town. Told you. Take a break, we'll wrap it all up for you right after this. We had a feeling this weekend was gonna be a blast. And that's exactly what's been delivered on day one, this circuit. It's just so fantastic. This driver at the moment, as we've seen over the course of the last few years, as he's dominated the V8 Supercar Championship, when he hits the top of his game, he is unstoppable. A repeat effort on the podium for Jamie Winkup, Craig Lowndes and Fabian Coulthard. So let's take you back to the start. Shane Van Gisbergen got a bad one. Mark Winterbottom went heavy left towards the pit lane wall there and made up a position, but it created a bit of drama up at turn one over the hill. Jonathan Webb from the word go in the Darrell Lee Commodore was really aggressive. So David Wall had an issue straight away. His race did not last one lap. Midfield, Scott Pye in the E. Cole Commodore and Lee Holdsworth who threw the first pitch out at the Round Rock Express, the local minor league affiliate to the Texas Rangers the other night. He said it was one of the most nervous nights of his life. Well, he was in a few battles today that would have made him shake. You watch this on approach. Oh, that was Todd Kelly and then whack. That was Chaz Mostert into the back of Todd Kelly. They're using every inch available on the entry to pit lane because they don't have to hit the speed limiter until right there. Wing Cup comes in. They do a typically brilliant performance. He's serviced and gone before he knows it. And that would be the story of his day. 
And Craig Lowndes was always waiting behind him. Then at the very back end of the race, we're waiting for this to bubble over. Just a tiny little mistake from Shane Van Gisbergen after putting so much pressure on fellow Kiwi Fabian Coulthard. And that allowed Jonathan Webb to go up into fourth and Coulthard to hold on to third position as uh, Jamie Wincup gets another chequered flag waved in front of his face. The 69th time he has seen that in the V8 Supercar Championship. The numbers are so impressive in his career. He also grabbed a pole position this weekend, as you know. So 44 career poles and 69 race wins. He's well and truly on the roll. Well, down here with Rick Kelly, 8th position, and James Mop Moffat, 10th. Now, guys, that's your 10th, 10th position in the Nissan team. Now, people wouldn't realise that's that's pretty spectacular up front. Yeah, it is actually, but I couldn't, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm a little disappointed to finish in eighth because we had six covered and uh, we ran out of fuel. They've set the race lengths right on the boundary for us and we knew that was going to be tough if it was green the whole way and sure enough, we ran out of fuel for the last race and unfortunately let a couple by, but nevertheless, the team's got to be pretty happy with, uh, with the development over the last little while and the pace that we've got here and I think four cars in the top 16 or so with a, a few dramas so tomorrow could be a good day. Rick just to understand that bit better at home so we've got the 112 litre fuel cells in the cars which is the big fuel cell you filled it up full but it's run out of fuel so that says to me everyone else in the pit lane is obviously marginal you must be using a little more fuel still at this stage. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Nissan Altima is brand new for us. We've got a brand new engine in there and we're developing it um, as quickly as we can. But um, it takes some time to compete with guys that have had engines for, you know, 10 years that they've been working on. So we're already um, a little bit slower in the straight line and then they, uh, they cut us off at the knees and make the race lengths um, unachievable for us to a certain extent. So it's a, it's a tough way to finish the day, but I'm, I'm pretty excited. We had two, uh, two of our cars in the, in the top 10, one JD, one Norton, and we'll probably hopefully have four in there tomorrow if we do a good job. Seriously, mate, I reckon you've done a stellar job. I don't think many people would have predicted 10 top 10s this time of year, so well done, seriously. Moff, um, big turn of form this weekend, mate. Uh, always lots of speed, but it just is really hanging. It's because of what Rick's saying. The cars are working well this weekend. You can get on with the job of being a race driver. Well, clearly, 20 corners around this track. Uh, corners are our, I guess, godsend at the moment. And um, like Rick said, the straight bits are hurting us. So the more corners, the better for us. And certainly the car is very speedy and racy, um, especially in that first sector where it's very twisty and, you know, flowing corners. So... Uh, look, top 10, got to be happy with it because, man, that's a competitive race. Like, it was uh, flat out the whole way, no safety car. And um, there might have been a couple of mistakes in there, but, um, you know, I was battling with Will Davo there for a bit. And I think we lost a bit of time in the pit stop, but uh, we've got a straight car and we can box on tomorrow. Well done, mate. Now, I know you've got a lot of fans back at home that are supporting this and team. A lot of heavyweights here this weekend too, mate, from Jack Daniels and Nissan. Bit of pressure there. Yeah, it's almost um, our home track to a certain extent, obviously with the Jack Daniels Distillery here and Nissan here as well. So, I mean, thanks for everyone for the support. It has been unreal this year. But uh, I must say, I think we need to have at least 10 rounds of championship right here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, boys, really, really pleased to see you doing well. Thank you. I'm up for that as well. You know I got an Altima when I got, I got to the rental yes. car at the, uh, at the airport, so I'll be top 10 on the way back to the hotel, no <laughs> question. So races 13 and 14 highlights you will see later today on 7. Just check out your local guides. And when we come back for 15 and 16, that is tomorrow morning again. Again, So on 7, mate, you can wake up with the V8 supercars. So for our Aussies on 7 Sport, we'll see you in the morning. For our viewers on speed right across the country here, we hope you enjoyed it. From Austin and the Circuit of Americas, all we can say is thank you. We'll see you again tomorrow.